William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. People who are in the market for murder should always pay full price. You can't get a cut rate on a killing. All you can get is a cut throat. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. In spring, they say, a young man's fancy lightly turns to thoughts of love. He doesn't go quite that far with a confidential investigator. He's been around too long. He's seen too much. He waits till it gets to be summer, and then, uh, if he's me, all he does is uh, buy a new tie. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon. I need a tie. Sport, business, or l'amour? I want to wear it around my collar. Oh, one of those. Are you going to try to impress anyone, or will it be just to keep your collar button from showing? I don't wear collar buttons. My shirts are all sewed together at the top. Must make it difficult to get into them. No. All I do is shrink my head. Now, look. I'd like a tie. Well, all right. By the way, is that your friend peeking in at the door? Friend? Hold on. No, I, I don't know him. I'm glad of that. Why? Well, it's hard to be sure at this distance, but he looks like the kind of man who... Who? Gets his ties at a department store. No. Yes. The cat. The clerk finally parted with a tie. It didn't cost much more than a week's salary. I had it wrapped and left. I walked down Madison Avenue and admired the girl. There were always girls walking on Madison Avenue, and they're always admirable. The little man who poked his head into the haberdashery store didn't look at the girls. He was too busy following me. I went into Willie's wagon. Only a very brave man, or a desperate one, would follow me there. He was either brave or desperate. Willie was too busy to bother about customers. He was on the phone worrying about the fifth at Saratoga. I decided to make conversation. Hey, you. Me? Come here. Uh, all right. Now, uh, sit down. Yes? Fine. Now, uh, that's the tie I just bought. Do you like it? Well, uh, frankly, no. You must be the kind of a man who buys his ties at a department store. <gasps> oh, it's like that. Here, drink some water before you pass out. No, I, I'm all right. You've also been following me around. Why? I've, I've been trying to get my courage up. To insult my taste in ties? No, to ask you to help me. You don't need courage for that. Just money. Yeah, you're right, of course. I, Mr. Craig, my name is Homer Dibble. How do you do? How do you... Uh, I am or was until last night an accountant for G.J. Thomas. The big department store boy? Yes. Well, I, uh, I, I was working on the quarterly audit yesterday, and I'd caught up on my regular work, and I found a minor discrepancy in the accounts. In whose accounts? I, I didn't know. I had only the final balance sheets. I'd have had to check back on the departmental reports to find out who was responsible. And did you do that? Oh, it was a question of getting authority, so I reported the discrepancy to G.J. himself. And? G.J. was very strange, abrupt. He said he knew about the discrepancy, that he was going to take care of the embezzler himself. And why the devil had I rushed the audit? He doesn't approve of ambition? Well, I, I, I don't know, but the last thing he said to me was... Yes? Dibble, you're fired. Nice man. Oh, oh I'm sure G.J. wasn't himself. Uh, Mr. Craig, I like my job at that store. There must be something behind G.J.'s firing me like that. If you'd look into it... Well, it could be... Uh, that minor discrepancy you mentioned, how much was it? $37,241.98. Hmm. Obviously an inside job, uh, that 98 cents. I think we'd better go visit Mr. Thomas. I, I don't dare. If he knew, I'd spoken to you about it. He's doing a very dangerous thing. Covering up a theft, 
Taking the law into his own hands, like playing with a loaded gun. You... you think it's that serious? It could be. Suppose we find out. Mr. Dibble was highly concerned. I was highly concerned, too. The situation had all the ingredients of a beautiful mess. I don't admire messes, especially when they involve $37,241. Oh, yes, 98 cents. Business at the Thomas department store must be good. Yeah, it is an impressive house, isn't it? Yeah. If they played their cards right, they could probably get Grant to move here. I'm worried. What about? Oh, G.J. is likely to be very angry with me. He might fire me. He did fire you. Oh, that's right. I don't think that doorbell took the first time. Maybe not the second time either, so... That's an answer, one I don't like. It was open. That yell came from someplace down that corridor. Oh, dear. Whatever will G.J. say? Oh, we'll ask him. Uh, first, we've got to find him, though. Uh, door up ahead's ajar. Uh-huh. Leads to the place these doors always lead, the library. Good heavens. G.J.'s butler's lying down. Looked very peculiar. Maybe he didn't think of that when he fainted. After he yelled. Fainted? At what? Well, it's seeing G.J. Thomas behind the desk here. I can't... Lying down, too. But his case is a little more serious. There's a knife in his back. Oh? Oh, dear. Easy, now don't you start fainting on me. What happened is obvious. We rang, the butler started down the hall, went into the library to check with Thomas, saw the blood, and... Well, what happened to Thomas is obvious, too. Someone... murdered him? Whoever it was didn't stick a knife into his back because he thought it would improve Thomas's disposition. What, uh, what shall we do now? Well, we could notify the police, but we won't. Come on. But... Uh... The butler can take care of that when he comes, too. We're going to the store. Why? Dollars will get you donuts that murdering Thomas was only half the murderer's job. My car was out front. We went away in a hurry. I couldn't be sure, but if two and two still added up to four, we were getting closer to the killer every block we traveled. Well, G.J. Thomas's pride and joy. There's a night watchman on duty, isn't there, Dibble? Yes, there is. Fine. Let's bang on the door. Net result, dead silence. Time's passing, Dibble. Would you have a key to the store? Well, yes, I do. Even though you were fired? Well, I, I forgot to turn it in. Uh-huh. Okay, open the door. All right. Now, where are the files kept? Second floor, accounting department. Lead the way. Yes, Mr. Craig. Place doesn't look right. No women battling happily over mock down girdles. Up these stairs, Mr. Craig. No sight or sound of the night watchman yet. I could be happier if I could now, locate him. Along this hallway. That door there. Uh-huh. Well, the light's on and... Now, don't faint, Dibble. There's your night watchman, unconscious but alive. More bodies lying around in this case than... Hey, Dibble. Yes? Smell anything? I... I think it's smoke, sir. Smoke? Where's that door lead? The inner office. The inner office. Oh. Smoke's a little stale. Somebody built a bonfire in the waste paper basket. Only ashes left. But what... Were the ashes before they got that way? Easy, Dibble. Is it? Yeah. Those were records, Dibble. The ones with the minor discrepancy in them. I, I imagine you're right. Doesn't take too much thought to see it. Thomas was murdered, the records burnt, no evidence of embezzling left. Dibble, in whose department could that discrepancy have arisen? Well, in several. Uh, three, anyway. 
Tell me about them. Well, maybe in Mr. Connor's department, that's sales. Or Mr. Wainwright's, he's promotion. Or Miss Welch, head of personnel. Uh Uh-huh. That's three possibilities for murder, and of course, there's a fourth. A fourth? Who? You. You're... You're joking. No. Matter of fact, you're the likeliest possibility. You were fired because Thomas had found you'd been stealing money. You killed him and burned the files. Do you believe that? Did you kill Thomas and so on? No. I always believe my clients, so I'll believe you. The police aren't likely to agree with me, though. Oh, dear. Better use stronger language, Dibble. You're in trouble. Once this thing breaks, I won't be able to help you much either. I'll be on the outside. If only... Dibble. Yes? How hard is it to get a job here? Well... If I'm going to be useful in this thing, I've got to have some kind of standing here at the store. I've got to be here. A job would be a perfect cover. Well, if you had a letter of recommendation... I'll have one. Uh, from one of the stockholders, say. Name one. Mr. Stuber. I'll have a letter from Mr. Stuber. You know him? You've asked your quarter of questions for tonight, Dibble. Oh, isn't your scheme a, a, a bit drastic? Maybe. But what they do to you for murder is even more drastic. Mr. Dibble blinked his eyes several times and started to turn green. On him, it didn't look good. I dragged him out of the store, and the air helped, and by the time I dropped him at his house, he looked comparatively normal. I wouldn't know compared with what. And the next morning, I reported to personnel at the G.J. Thomas department store. After a while, somebody got around to noticing me. It couldn't have been more than a week later that, uh... Mr. Craig. Yes. Come in, please. Thank you. I've just been reading this letter of recommendation of yours. You must be a slow reader. I beg your pardon? I spent most of the morning in that ante room. I, I didn't care for the furnishings to start with. Oh, look here. You're Miss Welch, aren't you? I am. Then why don't you stop trying to sound as if you were 50, hopeless, and hideous? <laughs> That's a nice blush. Well, now you can stop all that. I, uh... This letter gives you a very nice recommendation. It should. What? Mr. Stuber is very enthusiastic about me. So I notice. Which means that whatever I personally think of you, I'll have to hire you. Uh, what do you personally think? Oh, you don't have to answer that now. Thank you. Save it for after hours. I... The question is, where can you serve Thomas best? Well, it's your question. Go ahead and answer it. Mm-hmm. I could put you in lingerie. Over my dead body? Hmm. Say, there's a joke there if we want to struggle for it. We don't. Oh, I know. I don't like the look in your eye. It's not friendly. We're starting a demonstration display in the basement today of dishwashers. Dishwashers? I'm not the domestic type. Mm -hmm. Women away from home don't look for the domestic type. You'll do. Uh, Mr. Craig, is it? You know it's Mr. Craig. Does it have to be... Dishwashers? Yes. Okay, Miss Welch. To the dishwashers. They gave me a few instructions first and then let me loose in the basement with a dishwasher. Neither of us took to the other. But it was all right before the customers came. After that, everybody had trouble. Mm, No, madam, it doesn't make that noise all the time. Only when it's hungry. Madam, it's of no interest to me at all that your husband's a vegetarian. This machine washes dishes, not your husband. You want me to demonstrate this machine to you? Okay, lady. Now you take a dish here. Any dish, even one like this. Now you put it in the machine. Now you press the button. And the dishwasher, dishwasher. In the meantime, you can file your nails, hit your baby, spy on a neighbor, or if you're brisk, kill your husband. In short, carry on the ordinary activities of a housewife. And when you're through, yeah, find out you needn't bother any longer about that dish. You sweep up the pieces, place them in a convenient can, which can be purchased in the can department, and then you dine out. 
Good afternoon, madam. Craig. Oh, hello, Miss Welch. I've been watching you work. You should have told me. I'd have made an extra effort. Heaven forbid. There's a phone call for you, Craig, in my office. Thank you. After you're through, I have something to say to you. Mm, I'm looking forward to it. Only one thing. Before you go. Yes? Did you change the hookup on the machine around any? A little here and there. Didn't our mechanic take care of that? Sure. But then all the darn machine did was wash dishes. Miss Welch was very pretty, even when she wasn't blushing. She was even prettier when she blushed. But then I decided the red in her face wasn't a blush. I went to take my phone call. Hello? Mr. Craig? Yeah. This is the Samaritan Hospital. A friend of yours, Mr. Dibble, asked us to call you. What's he doing now? He was struck by a hit-and-run driver this morning. What's his condition? He wants to see you as soon as possible. I'll be over, his but... His condition uh, is fair, Mr. Craig. I suggest you put a guard in his room. But we don't do that with accident victims. What makes you think it was an accident? It took a little more than that, but finally a guard was assigned to make sure that Mr. Dibble's condition wouldn't get worse rapidly. Finish your phone call, Craig. Finished. Only the fact that the letter you brought me is from one of our largest stockholders keeps me from firing you. Let's be happy it was such a nice letter. But I'm not going to put you back in selling. An office job would be uh, safer. Let's see. Connor can use a clerk. Wainwright needs a bookkeeper. Have you ever kept books, Craig? Frequently. But then the library would always get nasty and... Well, I, <laughs> I mean, sure... Then you will report to Mr. Wainwright down the hall, promotion department. And Craig? Yes? Working for Mr. Wainwright has certain disadvantages. It has? Yes, Mr. Wainwright has a very quick temper when he loses it. And I can easily imagine circumstances under which he might lose it with you. Well, now, that's definitely unkind. It's murder. I went down the hall to the office of the terrible-tempered Mr. Wainwright. I wondered how accurate Miss Welch had been about just how terrible that temper was. So you're Craig. I'm Craig. You don't look like a bookkeeper. Sorry. Maybe it's because I'm out of practice. You do double entry, of course. Oh, sure. All the time. Indeed. Very well. You'll find your work laid out for you. The desk in the corner over there. Thanks. A bookkeeper, hmm? Only during office hours. Well, these are office hours. I'll be in my office if you need me. I'd, uh, I'd advise you to concentrate on your work, young man. Yes, sir. That should give you trouble enough. I didn't like Mr. Wainwright's last remark. It was so right. Hmm. Hello. Huh? Oh, hello. You the, uh... New bookkeeper? Yeah. I've discovered something, though. Uh, what's that? There's something basically wrong with bookkeeping. The assets always match the liabilities. It can't be coincidence. <laughs> yeah, you're Craig, all right. I'm Craig, all right. My name's Connor, head of sales. Craig, it uh, must have seemed a good idea to you. What must have? Pretending to be an employee here and working on the suspects from the inside. Oh, it was a wonderful idea. Didn't work too well, would you say? Oh, we all know who you are. Miss Welch? Wainwright? Yes. Did I talk in my sleep? No, I haven't slept around here yet. Miss Welch's receptionist recognized you. I didn't recognize her. A friend of hers once hired you. Too bad. Interesting, anyway, that a couple of suspects pretended not to know me. Miss Welch and Wainwright. Well... And the third one is maybe hoping to make that seem important. Clearing himself in the process. <laughs> All I can say to that is no. But um, I'd advise you to be careful. Whoever stabbed G.J. and knocked out the night watchman in order to burn the record... How did you know that the night watchman had been knocked out? Well, Wainwright told me. Forgetting that for the moment. Had there been any quarrels between Miss Welch and Thomas? No. How about Wainwright and Thomas? Well, Wainwright's got a violent temper. Perhaps I shouldn't say this. I may be doing Wainwright an injustice. You'll say it, won't you? What? Hello, Wainwright. You're not careful enough about shutting doors behind you. You might have asked me, Craig. 
Yes, I had a fight with G.J. I threatened to beat his brains out the next time I saw him. Well, that probably soothed him. Are you telling me this to show how truthful you are so I wouldn't bother considering you as a handyman with a knife? Well, you, you... Watch your temper, Mr. Wainwright. It's notorious. Connor, were you on good terms with Thomas? Sure. I made him laugh. Which one of you drives a car? We all do, including the luscious Welch. Too bad. It's lunchtime. I get hungry at lunchtime. I'll be back after lunch, though. Anyone want me to bring him a sandwich? Nobody did, which wasn't surprising. I would have had trouble getting a sandwich at the Samaritan Hospital anyway. I haven't got much time, Dibble, but... It uh, was nice of you to visit me. Not nice. I'm working. Dibble, could your accident this morning have been a genuine one? Oh, no. The car came right up on the sidewalk after me. Okay, next question. How much would it hurt you to be moved? Well, a bit, perhaps, but why do you ask? I want to take you back to the store with me. Is it important? Yes. Well, then it doesn't really matter how much it hurts, does it? It did hurt, but Dibble didn't whimper. I decided I liked him. I hoped I'd be able to keep him out of trouble. The trouble his late employer, G.J. Thomas, had run into. On the ride over to the store, I coached Dibble. He was horrified. I was asking him to tell a lie. By the time I got through telling him a few things about the methods with which murder is a court, he was very disillusioned. How's the wheelchair feel? Only way to take a walk. <laughs> uh, won't everyone be surprised to see me here? Happily surprised, except one person. Who's that? The murderer. Now, uh, the first stop, Wainwright's office. Now, let's get the door open and make an entrance. What the devil? Now, hello, Mr. Wainwright. Meet Mr. Dibble. I know Dibble. What happened to you, Dibble? Somebody tried to kill me. A rabbit like you? Even rabbits can be dangerous. Mr. Wainwright, uh, would you mind getting hold of Mr. Connor and Miss Welch? Why? It might be fun. I don't think it will be fun. Well, do it anyway. After all, you know who I really am. Well, all right. Mr. Wainwright didn't seem very happy about something or other. He's not a happy man. Don't worry about it. You remember what I told you to do? I remember. Good. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon, Mr. Connor. Brother, what a binge you must have had. I'm not hungover. I was run over. Oh, Sorry, I was just trying to be light and happy. Ah, the rest of our miserable little crew. Darling Miss Welch, stalwart Wainwright. Oh, of course, someone's missing. Who? G.J. Thomas, remember him? Shut up, Connor. Mr. Wainwright is so blunt, manly. If nobody minds, I'd like to point out that someone in this room murdered Thomas. I mind, but what can I do? Actually, there's no problem. The identity of the killer wasn't hard to establish. But there was a lot of confusion around that central point. It might help to clear it up. Well, go ahead. Clear it up. Thanks. Now, one of you three had embezzled some $37,241. And 98 cents. Let's not forget the 98 cents. Thomas knew about that, summoned the guilty one to his house in order to confront him or her with his or her guilt. Is that fact or theory? Half and half, say. Now, the guilty one promptly proceeded to kill Thomas. Dibble, whose account was short $37,000 odd dollars? Uh, Come on, Dibble. Uh, all right. Miss Welch's account. What? Well, well. You said something, Miss Welch? What? That statement's ridiculous. That won't stop him from making it in front of a jury. It'll be his word against mine. We all know the records themselves were destroyed. Still, a jury might believe Mr. Dibble. What do you think, Wainwright? I think Dibble's crazy. And you, Mr. Connor? I never cared for the luscious Welch, Craig. So efficient. I'm glad the record showed her to be the embezzler. But they didn't. What? Well, what are you... They were burned before Dibble got to them. Then how does he know she was the one? He doesn't. This isn't very funny. It isn't funny at all. Wainwright, did you tell Connor the night watchman had been knocked unconscious when the records were burned? 
No, I didn't know that myself. So, Connor, the only way you could have known was because you yourself knocked him out and burned the records, which showed you to be an embezzler. They... Maybe they did, but they were phony. That's why I had to burn them. With Thomas dead, I knew I'd be suspected of his murder, even though I wasn't an embezzler. A little weak, Connor. I... Mr. Craig. Yes? This isn't very, uh, very pleasant. Is it all right if I leave now? Sure. Thanks. Clever woman, Miss Welch. Forget her. What I want to know is why Connor... Let's not forget, Miss Welch. What are you driving at, Craig? You're all overlooking one small fact. Which is... G.J. Thomas was stabbed in the back. In the back? That means... It means that Wainwright, who threatened to beat Thomas's brains out, has to be innocent of Thomas's murder. Of course. Unless there were signs of a struggle. No signs of struggle. Then G.J. would never have let Wainwright get behind him. True. We already know I didn't stab G.J. Craig, will you stop sidling around? Keep your voice at normal level and keep talking. But where does G.J.'s being stabbed leave me? Equally innocent. The records show... They were false. ...that you were an embezzler. He'd summon you to his house to confront you with your supposed guilt. Would he have... Let me get behind him? Of course not. But there's someone who did get behind him. Someone who's behind this door. Sorry to disturb you, Rame. Yeah, I'll take that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Someone who got behind G.J. Thomas. Someone he didn't suspect and hadn't fought with. Who could it be but... Miss Welch. The police came and took her away. She'd stopped looking luscious by that time. She was a killer, trapped. And killers are never luscious or lovely or anything else but deadly. Miss Welch had embezzled the money, falsified the records, and... It was very clever of you to detect her, Mr. Craig. Thanks. Oh, I have your check here. Oh, forget it. What? You're getting your job back at the store, but even so, you can't afford me. Besides, I I make it a rule never to get paid twice for the same job. But you haven't... I will be. Don't forget that Thomas Department Store owed me one day's salary for, uh, for, uh... Well, I did demonstrate the dishwasher, but, uh... Never mind what it owes me the salary for. Just make sure they pay it. You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Death's Bargain Basement, was written by Louis Vitties. Next week, it's the strange story of Midsummer Lunacy, about which Barry Craig has this to say. In next week's story, Midsummer Lunacy, a fortune-hunting manicurist bites her nails down to the cuticles And the man of her schemes loses his mind easier than he loses his heart. Good night, folks. See you next week. The National Broadcasting Company has just brought you an NBC Radio Network production with William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator, directed by Arthur Jacobson. Also heard were Templeton Fox, Hillary Hall, Rye Billsbury, Olan Soleil, and John Stevenson. Eddie King speaking. It's tough to be left out. Yes, ask any serviceman how it feels when the mail is being distributed to discover you...